All right, I got all my stats, got all my show notes, everything set up. Yep. Holy smokes. Episode 27? I've already done 26 of these things? Here we go. Welcome to the VGK Bug Eye Guy podcast, an unofficial podcast discussing all things Vegas Golden Knights, a show designed for the fans by a fan. Produced locally in Las Vegas, Nevada, home of the Fortress. Weekly episodes include segments like Numbers Don't Lie, VGK Rewind, and What the Puck. And now, here's your host, Nick, the VGK Bug Eye Guy. What's going on, Vegas? Go to Knights fans. That's right, Nick, the VGK Bug Eye Guy is here. And welcome to episode 27 of the VGK Bug Eye Guy podcast. Well, I hope you guys liked last week's episode. Now, episode 26 was the first time that I changed up my voice, added a couple bumpers, added some new segments. I hope you like it. I got a good uh, response to the changes. Um, so yeah, I'm going to continue going. This is the second episode with Nick, the VGK bug eye guys, real voice. If you don't like it, uh, speed up this podcast and then it'll sound like my old voice. So since episode 26, the Vegas Golden Knights have had two games. We took on the Winnipeg Jets up in Manitoba, Canada, and we took on the Pittsburgh Penguins flowers, old team at the fortress. Now, next week's episode, just to give you guys a quick schedule, next week's episode, next Monday, will be a recap of today's game, the Minnesota Wild, and Wednesday's Nashville Predators. we got the All-Star break coming up, followed by the five-day mandatory bye week for the Vegas Golden Knights. So after this Wednesday, the 23rd of January, we will not have another Golden Knights game until February 1st, which means I will do a podcast next week, and then the following week, because there's no games to cover, I probably won't do a podcast unless some crazy news pops. So since the Vegas Golden Knights won't be playing, the VGK Bug Eye Guy is probably going to take a one-week break from the podcast. Now, of course, if something pops, there's some important news, something happens, well, the Bug Eye Guy is going to do what the Bug Eye Guy is going to do, and he's probably going to record a podcast or a quick video on social media. But either way, eh, whatever. All right, so... A lot of you guys might not know, but the Bug Eye Guy is a federal employee, and I've been on furlough status since December 22nd. Now, um, for you folks that aren't in America, uh, our political system's kind of screwed up right now. You know, it's a power trip between two uh, political parties, and uh, people like me are kind of stuck in the middle. It sucks. It uh, Hopefully it ends soon, but in the meantime, hey, I've got time on my hands. And one cool thing about living in Las Vegas, being a fan of the Vegas Golden Knights, is they have practice. Now, their practice is out here. Sometimes they're crazy, preferably on the weekends. They're really crazy. A lot of kids, a lot of families. But during the week when the kiddos are in school and most people are at work, where uh, the bug eye guy should be but isn't temporary right now because of everything going on in our country, the bug eye guy is able to go to practice. It's free. It's fun. It's anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on if they had a game the night before. They got a game. I mean, I went to practice two weeks ago, and it was 40 minutes. I went to two practices last week. One was an hour and a half, and one was almost an hour, and they worked on different things. It was really cool. Um, Injuries. A lot of people have been asking, hey, what's going on with the Vegas Golden Knights injuries? Well, being at practice, one of the first things I noticed was Colin Miller was back on the ice. Colin Miller was a full participation in two practices prior to the Pittsburgh game. So the bug eye guy's like, dude, I'm pretty sure Colin Miller's going to be back. And and for you guys that know me, uh, as of January 1st, 2019, I'm Team Merrill, Team John Merrill. But with Colin Miller coming back, old John Merrill's going back to the healthy scratch list. And Well, other couple injuries. Riley Smith. A lot of people have been talking about Riley Smith. What's going on with Riley Smith? Well, both days I was at practice. He was there. He was out skating on his own prior to practice. So it was no contact, no organized team activities, but he was out there skating. So that's a good sign that he's getting better. Bad sign is my boy, William Carrier, one of my favorite players on the team, as well as Malcolm Subban, have been no-shows. There's rumors that they have been at CNA, but nothing on the ice. Both of them are out on the IR with an undisclosed illness. Now, we don't know what that illness is, but hey, they're out sick. 
And I would love to see Carrier back. We'll talk about him later on in the podcast, but uh, I think we miss him on the fourth line. So let's see. Eric Halla. Eric Halla is still out for an undisclosed period of time. Colin Miller's pretty much coming back. In fact, newsflash, uh, he did come back against Pittsburgh. Uh, no Subban, no Carrier, and Riley Smith is skating. Now, I did see a couple Facebook posts. Uh, man, it must have been a couple days ago. Talking about Riley Smith, and he's hurt because a little birdie told somebody that he had a separated shoulder. Or he had a shoulder injury. Now, for you guys that are new to uh, NHL, new to being hockey fans, it's it's a little bit different. You know, in the NFL, they say he's got a bruised sternum or turf toe, or well, they they're. I mean, they don't come out and say it, but they release a lot more information than the NHL. Now, the National Hockey League. Upper body injury, lower body injury, that's really all you hear. And there's a reason for that. If someone has a banged up shoulder, you don't want the other team to know that that player has a banged up shoulder because they're going to target that banged up shoulder. They're going to take advantage of any any weakness that's out there. They're going to take advantage of it, right? So people talking about on social media about this, I don't know where they got their facts. I don't really care where they got their facts. To me, I don't need to know what's wrong with the players. All I need to know is when they're coming back, when they're going to be healthy, and that's it. I don't I don't need to know that, you know, Eric Halla blew his knee out or had a ACL or MCL or whatever it was that he had. I don't care. Lower body injury, that's good for me. I'm okay with that. I don't need to know, and you guys shouldn't either. We don't want that information leaking out to other teams, other opponents, right? I don't know. Trade rumors. A lot of people have been talking about trades. So the trade deadline is the end of February. We got plenty of time. Um, right now, because Riley Smith is uh, out and Carrier's out and Subban's out, Legacy's up on a recall from Chicago, and uh, we have roster spots. So Peary's in. Peary's played his 10 games. He's staying with the team. But what happens when Carrier or Smith comes back? We're still going to have to make some roster moves, which still leads the bug eye guy to believe that there will be some sort of trade for the Vegas Golden Knights. I don't know who they're going to move. I have a feeling it's going to be a fan favorite. It's going to be one of the bigger name guys, but who knows, right? GM, GM, George McPhee, I'm sure he's going to work his magic and figure it out. Who do I want to see come in? I don't really think we need another score. I think we're okay. I think if we're going to go and we're going to move an asset to free up a spot, I think we go after a D-man. I really do. I think we need one more stout defensive guy on the blue line to help solidify this team. I mean, John Merrill's played good. Uh, Brad Hunt's been okay when he's been in there. We do have Brandstrom, Haig, White Cloud, Bischoff. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Reinhardt. There's a bunch of them down in the AHL. So we have young guys coming up. But I think they might pull the trigger if they can get a solid, you know, first or second pairing defenseman, I think they might pull the trigger. And especially if they can move a couple contracts out in order to free up maybe a little bit of cap space or maybe just free up a roster spot. Either way, the end of February is going to be important. Expect the Vegas Golden Knights to be in the mix somehow. They might not make a flashy move. They might pick up someone like, I don't know, maybe like a Jake Muzzin from L.A., who's a consistent second-pairing defense. Doesn't score a lot, but he he plays a lot like McNabb. And I love McNabb, and yes, they were both kings. But they play really good defense. They play defense first, and that's they don't score a lot, but when they do, you're like, oh, cool, never scored a goal. I mean, maybe they pull the trigger on someone like that. It depends what they want to give up. And also, um, it's usually kind of tough to do a trade within the division, especially someone that you play four or five times a year. So, that alone might be an issue, but, hey, they could go after some of the demon in St. Louis. I don't know. What do you guys think? You guys think they're going to make a trade? I'm pretty sure they are, but lucky for us, we've got almost a month to figure out what's going to happen. So quickly, before I start talking about uh, the games from last week, this got brought up, and, and you know, I was thinking, man, this is a, this is a really good question. Who's the biggest free agent acquisition from last year? Now, a lot of you guys are probably thinking right off the top of your head, John Tavares, who came from the New York Islanders back home to his Toronto Maple Leafs. He's already got 30 goals. He's been tearing it up. Heck, Austin Matthews, their their young, uh, bright superstar, is kind of second fiddle to 
Tavares, I mean, John Tavares is a good player. Don't get me wrong. I wanted him to come to Vegas in the offseason. Obviously, the hometown, it just didn't work out. But he's been tearing it up. Now, here's the issue. You think it's John Tavares or head coach Barry Trotz, who came from the Stanley Cup winning ugh, Washington Capitals, went to the New York Islanders, who lost their star player in John Tavares, had questionable goaltending at best, and they're right up at the top of the division. So who's the bigger free agent acquisition? Right now, I'd lean toward Barry Trotz. I can't believe he's turned that team around in such a short period of time. I don't know. What do you guys think? All right, folks. Last week, the uh, Vegas Golden Knights held a gala, the Knights to Remember, Night to Remember. It was uh, downtown Las Vegas over at the World Trade Center, World Market Center, whatever they call that place. And Bug Eye Guy didn't go. One, I'm furloughed. Two, I'm not paying $500 to go to a fancy place where I got to wear a you know, fancy suit and and mingle and drink fancy drinks and eat food that's not going to fill me up but is fancy and has all these fancy ingredients in it. I mean, that's not really the bug egg guy. Um, but it looked like they had fun. I mean, it was a lot of interaction with the players, which was cool. I mean, they raised a lot of money, which is awesome. It's for a good cause. But yeah, the bug egg guy, eh, it's not really for me. And for me and my wife to go, it would have been like a $1,000. I'm like, uh, no, I'd rather spend that money on tickets. So, But either way, it looked really cool. It looks like they raised a lot of money, which is good. And congratulations to the Golden Knights and the foundation and Bill Foley and all the people that put it on. But the bug guy, not interested. Well, I've already rambled for like 11 minutes, so maybe we should talk some uh, Vegas Golden Knights. What do you guys think? How about a little VGK Rewind? It's time for VGK Rewind. A review and recap of last week's game. All right, folks, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, we only had two games to cover. We beat Chicago in overtime, and then after that game, uh, our Vegas Golden Knights headed up to Manitoba. Now, that's the hometown, or Winnipeg, which is the hometown of Cody Eakin and Ryan Reeves. We go up there. Now, the Western Conference is pretty pretty stacked at the top, and the uh, Winnipeg Jets are leading the pack, them and Calgary. So we knew it was going to be a tough game. And right off the bat, the Vegas Golden Knights lost this game 4-1. to Now you're thinking, oh, crap. Vegas Golden Knights lost 4-1. to They got their butts kicked. Well, on the scorecard, yes. But in reality, that's not exactly how the game went down. This was another game, like I've said all season, where we go up against another team's goalie, and he has, like, the game of the century, his best game ever. Now, Laurent Bershoint, who's the backup goaltender for the Winnipeg Jets, faced a ridiculous amount of shots from our Vegas Golden Knights. Hell, in the second period alone, it was a VGK record 26 shot attempts in that period. Seriously, 26 shot attempts. That's that's more shots than some teams get in a whole game in one period. Now, it was a Vegas Golden Knights record, which was good. But here's the problem. Here's the ultimate problem with this Winnipeg game. Two minor turnover mistakes. One, the ref kind of got in the way, and it was just a bad position. But really, two bad turnovers that ended up in the back of our net. Vegas was attacking. Vegas was throwing everything they possibly could at the net. Now, yes, some of the shots were center mass, easy stops for the goalie. But still, they were peppering him the whole game. Now, the game was 2-0. It was 2-0, but Vegas was really dominating when our friend Mr. Brandon Peary did this. And a save made by Brozois. Stastny filters it back to the line to McNabb. Long drive, score! Brandon Perry on the deflection of the McNabb shot. And Brandon Perry has cut the Winnipeg lead in half. So at least it was 2-1, to one, right? So 2-1, to one, Vegas is really bringing it. They're, they're, they're attacking. They're killer forecheck. They're using their speed. I mean, Winnipeg Winnipeg almost looked like they, they, they weren't playing. I mean, it was it was like fast. It was crazy. But Winnipeg won the game. And this is one of those games that the Golden Knights are probably going to look back on and go, man, we really should have gotten those points there. But once again, you go up against a hot goalie, you don't really have very many options. One of the main reasons we lost the Winnipeg game is the Vegas Golden Knights had six. Yes, six power plays. Six power plays, and they could not score on one of them. 
Not one. 0 for 6 on the power play. Now, to the Jets' defense, they were 0 for 2 on the power play. But the Jets beat us in hits, 30 to 19, which, again, leads me to believe that we need William Carrier back in the lineup sooner than later. Uh, Face-offs won. It was 27 to 34 in favor of the Jets. Takeaways. This was huge. Turnovers. Takeaways. 15 to 4, the Jets. That's not good. Shots blocked, 7 to 12 in favor of the Jets. The bottom line is if you look at all the stats with the exception of the shots on goal, um, Winnipeg dominated us, I guess. But if you actually watch the game, it was all Vegas all the time. They just could not get the puck past their goalie. No puck luck in this game. Now, this game did make some uh, mainstream media uh, top list, funny list. Uh, I don't know how you want to say it. They uh, they were talking a lot about this game because of Mr. Marc-Andre Fleury. Now, shortly before the end of the game, the Vegas Golden Knights are down 2-1. to one. Uh, Coach Gallant calls a timeout, brings the team over to the bench to come up with a game plan. And the plan is that they're going to pull Fleury. Now, Fleury's just kind of hanging out in the back over by his net, and he's kind of nonchalantly taking his stick and building a little what you would call a uh, a snow wall in front of the crease because he knows he's going to be pulled. So, you know, just trying to be a little sneaky, and this is what the announcers were talking about. <laughs> I'm not sure, eh? I trying to stack the goal line to make it a little bit more difficult. <laughs> That's exactly what they're doing. Someone for the Winnipeg bench, I think, sent them over. What's that conversation with the bench? You can't know. do that. <laughs> well, look at him laughing. <laughs> That's Gord Dwyer that went over to have a quick... So the, if you've seen it on TV, if you've seen the video clip, it's hysterical because the refs go over there and they're talking to each other like, man, Fleury tried to build a snow wall over here. This is funny, but we can't laugh because we're on TV. So then they skate over to the bench to explain to Coach Gallant of what happened. Of course, Fleury's right there, and McNabb's right next to him. And Fleury puts his glove right in front of his mask because he's laughing because he knows, like, oh, man, I got caught. And everybody on the bench is laughing. The coaches are laughing. Even the refs are laughing. I mean, there was no penalty. It wasn't enough to be this, like, crazy deal, but it was funny. And everyone was talking about the snow wall. And Fleury, do you want to build a snow wall? I don't know. It's kind of funny with all the talk in American politics reference to this wall for Flurry to be out there building a snow wall. I thought was kind of funny. So in the end, the Vegas Golden Knights ended up losing this game four to one. That's because they had two empty net goals. Gallant was trying, doing everything he can. I mean, those games happen. It is what it is. Honestly, they felt really good coming out of those games. Those are those games that when, when you get your butt kicked, but you know you gave 100%, you, you don't feel as bad. Here's Coach Gallant following the loss to the Winnipeg Jets. These were his thoughts on the game. A couple of mistakes, really, they made you pay on those. Yeah, it was exactly the same thing I saw, Gary. We played a real good hockey game. We made a couple of mistakes. They buried us, and, uh, and now we kept fighting back and got that early goal in the third period and made a game of it. But, uh, you know, they played a good, solid game, and their goalie was great, obviously. They did have a number of chances on the power play. Any thoughts on why it wasn't going tonight? Well, we had the chances. We just wasn't. Uh, we didn't put them in the back of the net. and. Like I said, I liked the power play tonight more than I liked it in a long time, and we just didn't put the puck in the back of the net, and you got to give their goalie some credit. He did a good job. It definitely does, for sure. I mean, it gets frustrating, even though they were moving the puck pretty good when they had it in the zone, but uh, like I said, when you get six chances and a five-on-three and you don't bury one, it gets a little frustrating. But, you know, we kept playing. We had lots of shots and lots of chances, and the goalie was outstanding. That was the, that was the difference. Yeah, I know. Nobody wants to lose. Like, I mean, but we've been on a good streak lately, and like I said, we come in here and played a good team on the road tonight, and... I thought we were the better team for most of the game, and like I said, they, they uh, found a way to win, and their goalie was great. And so, you know, don't want to, there's, there's not many positive to take from it, but again, I thought we played a good game. So, as long as we keep playing well, you're going to lose some games when it happens, but most part, you'll win a lot of those games. So, like I said, even Coach Turk was fairly positive. I mean, it was just one of those games where you go up against a hot goalie. This is what Marc Andre Fleury had to say following the snowball incident and following the 4 to 1 loss to the Jets. Yeah, I thought we uh, played well. You know, it was um, it was a close game. There was not much room on the ice. I thought, you know, for all night long, two um, quick teams. You know, playing fast, and um, I thought we played good. You know, we had the puck a lot, and uh, we had some power plays, some chances. But um, just wish I could have made one of those breakaway saves. You know, to keep us in there. 
Ja, det är det på klom och chad lo more att det på lo more pressure on the net, you know. Um but still there's still a lot of time to be played and um you know, I'll always believe in a group that we can come back in games. I play good, yeah, a lot of shots, no. Um it happens I think at this level every goal is good and um they all can um, give a chance to the team to win games and that's what we did tonight. If you don't love flowers, something's wrong with you, that's all I gotta say. All right, the final interview I have for you guys is from Brandon Peary. I mean, he did have the only goal for the Vegas Golden Knights, his eighth of the season. Here's what Brandon Peary had to say following the Jets' loss. Uh, I thought we played pretty well, and, uh, you know, I was guilty of a bad one. You know, we had a lot of momentum. Our power play wasn't clicking, but make a play like that, it's unacceptable. They did a pretty good job uh, after you scored your goal to get it to 2-1. They kind of shut things down pretty well in the third. Yeah, you know, it's... The puck was bouncing out there, and I thought, and, you know, we played all right. And we kind of got away from our game a little bit, getting it deep and forechecking quick and reloading, and uh, it was unfortunate. I mean, six on five wasn't good enough either. I mean, it's a privilege to play in those positions and wasn't good enough. A little frustrating in the fact that you had, you know, you tons of time in terms of possession. You out-attempted them. You did everything well except for you made a couple mistakes. You know, he get put in a role to, you know, be an offensive contributor. And, uh, you know, I feel like it wasn't good enough. So my quick recap on the Winnipeg Jets game is uh, power play. We got to get better on the power play. Uh, maybe a little bit more. I can't say more shots on goal because they lit them up. I mean, maybe better placement of shots on goal. I, I don't know. Honestly, the Vegas Golden Knights have been on such a good streak of winning so many games or getting points. We can't win every game. It sucks that we lose a game against a tough opponent like the Winnipeg Jets. Now, you guys also have to remember, this is the first time we've played Winnipeg since we beat them in the Western Conference Finals last year. So it was the last team in the West that we had not played yet this season. And I'm sure they wanted a little bit of revenge. I'm sure Paul Stastny wanted a little bit of revenge. I mean, that was his team for half of last season. He lost to the Vegas Golden Knights, but hey. You win some, you lose some. I look forward to the Jets coming to the Fortress, coming to our house in front of our fans and see what happens in that game. All right, enough about the Jets. So the Jets game was on Tuesday. Now, the Vegas Golden Knights did not have another game until Saturday against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now, they had some issues with their aircraft and they didn't fly back Tuesday night. They didn't come back until Wednesday due to some mechanical issues with their aircraft or something. Either way, they came back Wednesday. Now, the Bug Eye guys I mentioned earlier went to practice on Thursday, and I went to practice on Friday. Now, the cool thing about the practice on Friday was the fact that the Vegas Golden Knights, number one and number two power plays. So you had Patches, Stasny, Tuck, Marchi, uh, Carlson, Reeves, Peary, Theodore, um, Schmidt, Miller, all out on the ice about 30 minutes before practice started. And all they were working on was the power play. Zone entry on the power play, passes for the power play. I mean, and, and honestly, I was like, oh, thank God. Like, this is what they need. This is, this, is, this is super important. This is what they need to practice on. I was so happy that they were out there practicing. And it was cool. The bug eye guy got to practice early and got to see that before most of the fans got there because... They announced that practice was going to be at noon, and it ended up uh, at about 11.30. They were out there practicing the power play, and then the full practice started at noon. Now, most of their practices are like 10.30 or 11 o'clock. Uh, the Friday one was at noon, I think partially because the night to remember gala was the night before. Um, I don't know. Either way, I went to practice. I got to see him practice the power play, which was really cool, and then, of course, the other team came out and and, uh, yeah, it was, uh, that was a good practice. If you guys are ever in Las Vegas, City National Arena is about 20 minutes outside of town. So if you fly in from the airport and you land at McCarran International Airport, it's about a 20-minute drive uh, on the west side of town. It's right by the Red Rock Hotel and Casino, and they're also building a new AAA baseball field for Las Vegas. For the, they used to be the 51s. Now they're going to be called the Las Vegas Aviators. Either way, the ballpark is directly behind City National Arena. Now, City National Arena is a nice building. It's got the Arsenal, which is a VGK uh, store that sells jerseys, hats, all kinds of Vegas Golden Knights gear. 
and they got two sheets of ice. So the right side is where the Vegas Golden Knights practice, and above is where all their team offices and stuff. And then on the left side is another sheet of ice for Pee Wee, beer leagues, you name it, they play them out there. Now, as far as autographs, that's a hit or miss kind of thing. I know they've got an area cordoned off for kids to go over there. The last couple practices I was at, uh, the players were in such a hurry, they were kind of on the ice and then off. I mean, so, yes, you probably could. Yes, you need kids. Um, but either way, it was cool. So the Bug Eye guy went to a couple days of practice. It's a free thing to do if you're in Vegas and the Golden Knights are in town. Go to their Twitter site. Do not go to a Facebook page and post, hey, one of the Golden Knights practicing. That's super annoying. It super irks a bunch of us fans. Go to Twitter. They tweet out every day that they're going to have practice a couple hours before. Hey, come join us at City National Arena today at blank time for practice. That's how you find out. So the Vegas Golden Knights looked pretty good, in my opinion, against the Jets. And then they looked really good in practice. So I'm thinking, okay. This is going to be a tough matchup. Don't get me wrong. Now, I know Pittsburgh, the night prior, Friday night, played in Arizona. They won in overtime with like a minute something left in overtime. Kessel got a game-winning goal, and they beat the Arizona Coyotes. But now they had to come to Vegas, and it's only a 45-minute flight. And then they had to play the next night against their old goalie, Mr. Marc-Andre Fleury. Now, Sid Crosby and uh, Malkin and a bunch of those guys, they've got a relationship with Flower. They're still good friends. That's cool. This is war. This is the fortress. This is uh this is Vegas Golden Knights. This is uh this was a huge game. And initially when I first showed up to the fortress for the game, immediately as soon as I got out of the parking garage, I noticed, oh crap, here we go. This is gonna be one of those games that uh has a lot of visiting fans. Now the cool thing about Pittsburgh fans, and I'm gonna say this on record, for the most part they are pretty cool. I mean, you got to realize a lot of them love flower. flower. As much as Vegas Golden Ice fans love flower, that first love came from Pittsburgh fans. So they cheered for flower, which was cool. And they weren't like super dicks. I mean, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, like some opposing fans are just kind of jerks and assholes and, and dicks. And, and these Pittsburgh fans, at least the ones that I encountered, were, were relatively cool, which was a good thing. Now, if you guys have never been to a game at the Fortress, uh, Vegas is unique to other hockey towns, being that we're the entertainment capital of the world. Everything's bright and glitzy and glamour because it's Vegas. The arena itself is on the strip. It's directly behind the New York, New York Hotel and Casino. It's right smack dab in the middle of everything. And Vegas does things big, including our pregame show. Now, last year, it was all about the sword and the stone, and the guy would come out and fight. And then in the playoffs, they really stepped up the pregame entertainment. Now, fast forward to this season, at the beginning of the year, um, they had kind of a new show. You know, it was, uh, they come out, and they kind of fight. Well, first, they try and run up to the mountain to get the Stanley Cup, and then they meet on the ice, and they try and fight. And then the Golden Knight knocks the sword out of the opposing guy, and then they shoot the arrows and block it off. And, I mean, it's kind of cool, but it was like, okay, we're like 40 games into the season. Actually, we just played our 50th game. Maybe it's time they change it up. Well, I mean, I didn't complain, but I was just thinking it. Well, apparently other people were thinking it too, and the Vegas Golden Knights Entertainment Division uh, changed it up. So right before the Pittsburgh game this last Saturday, they did a new intro before the game. My initial thoughts were it's really cool. Um, it's a little bit long, especially when Golden Pipes doesn't sing the anthem because the lady that sang the anthem was like super long as well. Uh, it probably could be a little bit shorter, but the premise is um, Bill Foley, who's an ex-Army guy, sends out a team to search for something. They end up finding it, and it's the old stone with the sword stuck in it, but out in the desert. So they fly a helicopter out there and they bring it back to the fortress and they drop it center ice. And then he knows, Bill Foley being the, the owner, he knows who can who can get the sword out of the stone. Well, newsflash, it's uh, the Golden Knight from last year. So he comes skating out and he pulls the sword out and says, yeah, and then he gets the place all fired up. Either way, I'm glad they changed it. I'm glad it's something new. It's a couple minutes too long, but I'm okay with that. Hey. I'm glad they're changing it up. It's good. I mean, if you guys haven't seen it, go on any social media. In fact, go to VGK Bug Eye Guy 
Um, go to me on Facebook. Facebook, I've got links on my page to that video. You can watch the whole thing. Of course, it's somebody filming it from the stand, so it's not like HD, super great quality, but it's it's good enough for you to watch the show and see it. So in a few hours uh, after I'm done recording this podcast, I will be heading down to the Fortress for our Vegas Golden Knights to take on the Minnesota Wild. It's a 3 p.m. afternoon game on Martin Luther King Day, and today is Martin Luther King Day, so uh, shout out to MLK. But yeah, so for you folks that haven't been um, and you're going today, you're going to get to see the new pregame show today, I'm sure, which is pretty cool. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the atmosphere at T-Mobile was crazy because it was packed. There was like 18,500 fans. There was a lot of Pittsburgh fans. There was a lot of Vegas Golden Knights fans. And this game was was kind of crazy. Like right off the bat, Phil Kessel scored a goal like 351 into the first period. He scored a goal. It was kind of a deflected tip. And I'm thinking, oh, crap. Here we go. Here we go, Vegas Golden Knights, man. What are we going to do? What team are we going to see? Well... We got a power play not shortly after that when uh, Dumoulin from Pittsburgh got busted for tripping. And not a couple minutes later, uh, Shea Theodore, blister shot from the left side, goes in and we're tied up 1-1. I'm thinking, okay, good. Then Pacioretty had a beautiful pass from Stasny. Now we're up 2-1. Oscar Lindbergh, another Lindbergh signing, second goal of the year. Now this was a two-on-one with Carpenter and Lindbergh. And Ryan Carpenter, who had a birthday just a couple days ago, uh, happy belated birthday to Ryan Carpenter, made a beautiful pass over to Lindbergh, and he buried it. So going into the first intermission, Vegas Golden Knights are up 3-1. to I'm thinking, oh, dude, this is good. Yeah, well, second period, 16 seconds into the period, freaking Simon scores, and all of a sudden the the Vegas Golden Knights are down 3-2, to and then 5.56 in the period, stupid Sidney Crosby. I know Flower hated this, but it was a perfect pass. He tied up the game. I mean, they passed it right from behind the net, right to the middle. No one was covering him. Crosby, bang, bang, 3-3. Three to three. But then, the Vegas Golden Knights secret weapon, Mr. 81, Jonathan Marcheseau. He comes out, and he gets a goal. And it was nice. And then, he gets another goal. Now he's got two goals in the second period. And the Vegas Golden Knights are up 5-3. to three. Third period, William Carlson comes out, gets a goal, nice goal from a pass from Colin Miller. And then at the very end, now this this was crazy. So so Jonathan Marchessault, I swear he played like the last three minutes of the game. I mean, we were up six to three, so the score was not an issue. Marchie had two goals. They were looking for him to get the hat trick. So Gallant's like, whatever, Marchie, just stay out there. And hopefully somebody can eventually get you the pass so that you can score an empty netter and you can uh, get the hat trick, I guess. And I don't really know why Pittsburgh pulled the goalie. I mean, they were down three. and It's not like they were going to come back. But either way, Max Pacioretty finally found Marchie, and Marchie shot it for the hat trick. Now, this is what it sounded like, all three of Marchie's goals in this game. Take a quick listen. Perry back in to out. To Smith out to play it away for the oncoming Carlson. Mark Giselle picks it up, walks in, shot, and he scores! To Smith played that pack up the board, but Mark Giselle took it right back, and he gives Vegas the lead. Miller with a wrister. Now Mark Giselle in front, scores! Jonathan Mark Giselle, backhand to forehand, tucks it in, and the Golden Knights have a five. Marcheseau up ahead of Pacioretty, looking for Marcheseau, trying to set him up for the hat trick. Wrist shot towards the net, and he scores! Jonathan Marcheseau, the second hat trick of his career as the hats rain down in Vegas. 17th of the year, first hat trick as a Golden Knight, second career hat trick. And Vegas up 7-3 with 21 seconds left. And that's it! The Golden Knights, seven to three winners over the Penguins, paced by the hat trick from Jonathan Marchessault and some huge saves in the second period by Mark Andre Fleury. Now this was cool for Marchessault. I'm glad he got this goal. I'm glad he got the hat trick. I mean, it's cool. Trust me, it was his second of his career, his first as a Vegas Golden Knight, the second hat trick in the history of the Vegas Golden Knights. While Bill had one last year, it was cool. I was happy. 
I was also happy that this game worked out the way it did because earlier in the second period, when it was tied 3-3, to the Pittsburgh Penguins got a power play. Now, the initial call on the ice was a goal by Avengi Malkin for Pittsburgh. Now, I was in the fortress, so I couldn't really see a good replay from where I was. I thought maybe goalie interference, I don't know. But what ended up happening was Malkin kicked the puck into the net. Now, it was a Toronto review, and I'm thinking, oh, crap, here we go again. Our friends in Toronto are going to screw over the Vegas Golden Knights. And I'm also thinking, kicked in, well, this just happened to us last week where Belmar was literally stopping. Both skates were at an angle, digging into the ice to stop. The puck hit his skate, then went in. I thought it was a good goal, 50-50 on people saying good goal, not good goal. Either way, it didn't count for us. Now, fast forward a week later, and it's like, holy crap, we're getting another one of these calls. Is it going to not go against us again, or are we going to be good? Well, Toronto make the right call, and Malkin did, in fact, kick the puck into the net. Therefore, no goal. Place went nuts, and this was the momentum shift in this game. Here was the actual call on the ice from the officials. And it took the Penguins just 17 seconds on the power play. They've scored three times in the second period. Oh, is that a kicking motion? Not sure. He tries to kick this to his stick. So this will be under review. Here's a quick decision. Here's Trevor Hansen. After reviewing the play, it's been determined the puck was kicked in. We have no goal. Man, I was happy this call finally went our way. Here's what Coach Gallant had to say about the the goal and the momentum shift. Yeah, that was a big part of it. Obviously, uh, we were, when you look at it, you're hoping you're going to get that right call because it happened to us last week. So it was a huge part of the game. I, mean, I think it was 3-3, wasn't it, at that time? And it would have made it 4-3 for them. So it was, a, it was a big turning point for sure. So an overall review of this game, the Vegas Golden Knights immediately down one nothing. So the thought of getting free donuts at the Fortress was immediately out the window. And we could just enjoy the game. Having a 3-1 lead, then them tying it up, then that goal being disallowed, momentum shift. Uh, Marchi scored two goals, 5-3 going into the third. We pick up two more. We end up winning 7-3 against Flowers' old team. Now, the cool thing about beating the Pittsburgh Penguins is this is a highly visible team. This is a, a favorite of the NHL pundits. They're right up there with the Lightning, the Maple Leafs, the Capitals. These are one of those teams, the Blackhawks, one of those teams that the NHL pundits love to talk about. So now you're forced to talk about the Vegas Golden Knights beating the shit out of the Pittsburgh Penguins, right? Well, nope, not much. I've scoured the internet. I've scoured all the broadcasts. Not much talking because when the Vegas Golden Knights beat the crap out of one of the good teams, they're like, oh, crap, how do we explain that? It's, uh, I don't know. So the Pittsburgh game was a 7-3 victory at the Fortress. The place went nuts. The fans were excited. Here's what Coach Gallant had to say after the game following the 7-3 victory. Yeah, I thought we played, uh, it was a wide open game. It was, uh, it was a game back in the 80s for me. I mean, there was lots of chances both ways. I think Tucky had two or three breakaways tonight. In the first 40 minutes, we probably had, uh, I think, four breakaways and a bunch of two-on-one. So I thought we were creating good offensive chances. But on the other side of it, they had a lot of chances too. I mean, they got some great players over there. and. Uh, but I just thought it was a wide open game. It was a very entertaining game for the fans, and uh, it was a lot of fun. They were rolling. They got the, the goal in the first year for the second period to make it 3-2, three, three, two, three, two, and then they got the tying goal shortly after that. So, no, it, it definitely changed. I mean, uh, I didn't like the way we came out. We had a, great, a pretty good first period being a 3-1 lead. But, uh, you know, game, there's lots of moments in games when things change, and uh, I think the fourth goal for us was huge. I'd like to say yes, but uh, you know what? It's uh, it's a great team that you're playing, and you're playing superstars over there. You're playing Crosby, you're playing Malkin, and those type of players, Castle, all those guys. So that's the fun part about this game tonight. They're not in their conference, so it doesn't seem to be the same the same atmosphere. But here's a team that won a lot of Stanley Cups, and they're still a great team. And I like the way our team responded tonight. I like the you know the way we competed and battled, and it wasn't looking good when it was three three, even though we had the three one lead, and they come back and got three three and. I like the way we responded to the rest of the game after that. And obviously, both, I think, you know, they, we got six goals against our goaltender, but I thought he was outstanding. He made some great saves, and I thought Fleury made some unbelievable saves too. So they both played a great game. It could have been a 9-7 game for somebody. Here's what Jonathan Marchessault had to say following his second career hat trick, first as a Vegas Golden Knights in the locker room following the 7-3 victory. 
you going to do with, uh, with all the hats? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's uh, my decision necessarily, uh, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's fun that people uh, get it out there, maybe put it in a, give it to a charity or something. Four goals from your line, good that you guys got going tonight. Yeah, I mean, it was a... I mean, our first period, we weren't necessarily happy. I mean, as a line, we take a lot of pride playing well defensively, and uh, uh, we got uh, give a little bit too much chances there. But we uh, we played better in the second half of the game, and it was good. After what he did for your team tonight, it was a nice for Flower to get an assist on your empty netter there at the end of the night. Did he? Yeah. Uh, it's awesome. Good for him. I mean, uh, he made big saves, and he just put it in the area. And, uh, I mean, Patch uh, made a poised play there at the end, and I was able to bear of course, you can't have a Penguins game without a post-game interview from Mark Andre Fleury. I mean, he's BFFs with Sid Crosby. It is his uh, old team, right? Here's what the Flower had to say following beating his old team seven to three. Practice and your guys are good shooters, right? And um, I know they take pride in trying to score and practice and stuff. I think it makes uh, it makes me better, right? I gotta work hard to stop the puck, and, uh, and it gets me ready for games like this. I guess. Just from a sporting event, entertainment standpoint, this one, this felt like a prize fight. This felt like a, a huge event. Uh, was it enjoyable? It was, yeah. Um, you know, for me, I guess it was always uh, special playing these guys, right? And um, it was a fun night. The whole building was uh, was rocking. The atmosphere was awesome, and um, you know, we got six goals, so the, the crowd was going to it. So it was fun, uh, fun to be part of it. You personally get up a little extra when you play these guys. I mean, you, you didn't get to play earlier in the year, but yeah. you know, facing them tonight. Uh, yeah, I want to do well, obviously, right? Or um, I don't know. I just <laughs> want to win, right? Like every night, but it's just. It feels more weird when you play, um, you know, the coaches I had or the players I had. I played with for so long. And their team changed a lot the last two years, but there's still a lot of other guys that I've played with for many years. Colin Miller, Colin Miller, first game back after being injured. Colin Miller played a pretty good game. Here's what Colin Miller had today following the victory. You know, you're feeling a little weird for a bit, but then I think as the game goes on, you feel better and better. And it was great. You know, a Saturday night crowd here in Vegas is always, uh, you know, pretty loud, and they were definitely into it tonight. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, the third period was great. I thought that was the best period, definitely. But um, the second period, they were pushing really, really strong. And uh, Mark made that big save uh, after that disloved goal. And that was, a, that was a big, you know, seemed to be a big turning point because we, you know, bought it two after that. And, and uh, you know, we were able to move forward from that. So that was a big, big moment for sure. So, yeah, they're definitely important. Uh, playing at home, you know, where we want to be. I think we've had a great record here again, you know, this year. And um, it's always, you know, to our advantage to be playing here and really just focus on those two games and then have some time off. I think it took a period. Um, and then, and then you know, I felt better. Um, that first period was definitely a little <laughs> a little suspect, but uh, that's to be expected with that okay, much time the, off. The speed, you really can't really comprehend the speed of practice that yeah, you can during the Exactly. Game, so it's yeah. tough to it's tough to, you know, you can do your cardio and all that stuff, but um, when you're looking around and getting those bumps, you know, you don't really get that in practice. So um, it was I was, you know, happy that it uh, came back sooner than later. Folks, I know I'm inundating you with these interviews, but I really think it's important to add to the podcast. Here's my final one following the Pittsburgh victory from Max Pacioretty. Take a listen. Fan on it, and, you know, uh, breaks like that, I guess, happen. And um, it still was a great play, and especially a great play by Tucky to, to start that. But uh, you're always trying to play in a triangle. Um, you see Boston do it a lot. So, you know, if pucks are, you know, blowing up or if the pucks end up in an area where you're not expecting, if, if you're in that tr uh, triangle, then you're able to, uh, you know, jump on loose pucks, and that's what happened there. Your line mate, Alex Tuck, he's now at a career high in points. He's still got 30-something games to go. Can you just talk about his progression from the first time you skated with him to tonight? He, he's a great player. Um, there's no secret about that. I, I don't know much about his progression because, obviously, this is my first year, but since day one today, this year, he's been uh, outstanding. Um, uh, you see how fast how big he is um, when he holds the puck there's really no one that can skate with him and and knock him off the puck so um, we're fortunate to have him on our team I'm very fortunate to play with you know a player of that caliber and um, you know it's a lot of fun it does yeah um, but you know what this team's resilient so it was definitely a good break and we knew that we got a bit of a, a lucky break because you know hitting two skates like that but at the same time, the team's are resilient. I feel, uh, you know, our mindset, the way we were able to uh, skate them down, wear them down for the rest of the game. Um, you know, it definitely was a break, but uh, you'd like to think that we would have been able to battle back uh, regardless. 
I'm glad the Vegas Golden Knights are in the position where they are kind of under the radar. The pundits aren't really talking about them, but they should be. They're all over the Calgary Flames, and don't get me wrong. The Calgary Flames got like 69 points. They're leading the Pacific Division. They're right at the top of the West. They're playing really, really good hockey, and they're playing really, really good hockey, and they have James Neal, who has like five goals and kind of sucks this year, but he's making a ridiculous amount of money. Now, besides that, the Vegas Golden Knights have had points in like uh, like 11 of 13 games or something like that, or 12 of 14 games. The problem is so is the Calgary Flames. The Vegas Golden Knights are winning all these games, and they're climbing up to standings. But so are the Calgary Flames, so we can't really gain any traction on them. Now, just so you guys know, we do still have to play Calgary a couple more times. When you play heads up, that's a four-point swing. That's two for you and two they don't get. So those games are probably going to be very important for the division later on in the year. But for now, it's good to be in third place. We're one point out of second place. We have more wins than San Jose. The only issue is uh, San Jose's had more overtime losses. In fact, while I'm talking about numbers, why don't we dive right in now to numbers don't lie. And now, numbers don't lie. The segment in the podcast where your host is about to bore you with player and team stats that you probably won't remember. Now, I love this segment of the podcast because I can fly through these numbers because I know you guys aren't going to remember and you really don't give a shit. So here we go. Right off the bat, Alex Tuck. Alex Tuck is leading the Vegas Golden Knights points with 38 points. He's got 15 goals, 23 assists, career highs. For Alex Tuck, Jonathan Marchessault's in second with 34 points, 17 goals, 17 assists. Wild Bill, 16 goals, 16 assists, 32 points. Riley Smith, Riley Smith's only played in 45 games. He's got nine goals, 18 assists for 27 points. Come down the list, 13 goals, 13 assists for 26 points for Pacioretty. Shea Theodore, look at Shea Theodore as a defenseman. Played in 49 games, six goals, 16 assists, 22 points. Not bad, right? Let's come on down to Brandon Peary, 12 games, 8 goals, 5 assists, 13 points. Ryan Reeves, 49 games, 8 goals, 7 assists, 15 points. You kind of get where I'm going with. Who else do you guys want to hear about? How about we pick John Merrill? Why not, right? John Merrill's played in 28 games. He has 1 goal, 4 assists for 5 points. 5 points in 28 games. Yeah. Now, you guys know the VGK Bug Eye guy is a fan of the defense and fan of the hits. And uh, our boy William Carrier, number 28 for the Vegas Golden Knights is still leading the league in hits. He's got 219 hits. Now, here's the problem. He's only played in 44 games. We don't know when he's coming back. Revo's played in 49 games. Revo's got 182 hits. So, Revo's made a, a little bit of move to catch uh, William Carrier. The good news is, is Milan Lucic has played in 48 games. He's third on the list, and he's got 166 hits. So, Lucic, 166, Revo, 182, William Carrier still sitting at 219. Good thing old uh, Carrier got a, got a little lead, but I'm ready for him to come back. I'm ready for him to start hitting people. I'm ready for the fourth line to be back to Belly, Carrier, and Revo. Get healthy, buddy. Get back on the ice. All right, as I was talking earlier about the Flames, so here's the updated point standings. As of Sunday evening, after all the games, Sunday, the 20th of January. Flames, 69 points. Sharks, 63 points. Vegas Golden Knights, 62 points. Now, that's Pacific Division. If you want to talk about the Western Conference, you've got the Flames sitting at first in 69 points. The Jets are second, 64. Sharks, 63. Golden Knights, 62. Nashville Predators, 60. So, the Vegas Golden Knights, as it sits right now, is third place in the Pacific Division. 11 points to the good on a playoff spot. So, they're 11 points above the eighth seed, the second wild card, which is a good thing. Another good thing is a lot of these teams have now got caught up. You know, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about games at hand because the Vegas Golden Knights had played so many games. Well, this week, we only played two games, and it was Tuesday and Saturday. So, during this week, other teams have been able to play more games and get caught up. Now, the bad thing is, is Vegas was tied up with the Flames. Unfortunately, they had a couple games and then won. And remember, folks, we've played the Flames twice this year. Now, we shut them out in our house, and they beat our ass in their house. So, it's going to come down to it, but I'm excited. 
What's on tap? What do we got going on in the next couple games? Well, as I mentioned earlier, shortly after I'm done recording this podcast, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights are taking on the Minnesota Wild in a Martin Luther King afternoon 3 p.m. puck drop. Be heading over there. All the season ticket holders are supposed to wear their gold jackets that they gave us that are, uh, honestly, it was a good gesture, but they're cheap, crappy, falling apart jackets. But hey, they're still cool, and I'm going to wear it today to the Fortress. Then we got Wednesday. Wednesday, we got the Nashville Predators coming to our house. Now, the Nashville Predators are a pretty good team. They're always right there at the top of the Western Conference, and it'll be a good matchup for our Vegas Golden Knights. Now, after that game, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we don't have another game until February 1st. Now, our Vegas Golden Knights, Nate Schmidt talked about this in an interview last week, so... We finish this Wednesday, then we have the all-star break, then we got their mandatory bye. And when we come off of all that, our poor Vegas Golden Knights have to go to South Florida and take on, well, they got to take on one game against Carolina, then they got the Florida Panthers, Tampa Bay Lightning, and then head on up to Detroit. There's three days between the Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning game, so our Vegas Golden Knights get to hang down in South Florida, hopefully enjoy some decent weather, go to Detroit, Then they come back to the Fortress, and we take on the Columbus Blue Jackets, Arizona Coyotes, Toronto Maple Leafs, and then the Nashville Predators yet again. So we've got some some good teams that are going to face us after this bye. Vegas Golden Knights have to be ready. Carolina's playing good. They just picked up Nino Niederreiter from the Wild. So uh, that's going to be a good matchup. The Panthers are always hit and miss. That's Gallant, Riley Smith, and Marchie's old team. Then you got the Tampa Bay Lightnings, which uh, if you don't know about the Tampa Bay Lightning, you don't follow hockey. They're the best team in the league. They've got the best record. They're 31, 10, and 2. Um, they're, they're really good, but I think the Vegas Golden Knights game matches up well against them, so that'll be interesting. Detroit, Detroit, you never know what team you're going to get out of them. So, yeah, um, after the bye, there's some tough games coming up, some exciting games to come up, and uh, I'm looking forward to it, and you guys should be too. All right, last week, episode 26, during the uh, Numbers Don't Lie segment, I included a portion about the Chicago Wolves, and I I thought it was important that there are AHL affiliate. A lot of the players on that team are names you guys are familiar with. And In fact, yesterday, I posted on social media. I blasted it out. I was a little late, and I apologize if you didn't get it in time. But our Chicago Wolves took on the Milwaukee Admirals, and it was uh, broadcast on NHL Network yesterday at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Now, the Bug Eye guy is not going to lie. I recorded that game. I did watch it, but I did not watch it live. And the reason I didn't watch it live was, I don't know, there was this NFL game between the New Orleans Saints and the Los Angeles Rams going on. And if you guys are listening and go, Bug Eye guy, I don't like NFL. Okay, that's fine. There's There's no issues with that. But I do like football. I like football and I like hockey. I'm not a big baseball fan. I'm not a big basketball fan. I watch baseball, but it's just too many games and too long. And I'm not a basketball guy. But I like the football. I like playoffs. And um, for anybody that listening to this that watched the football games this weekend, uh, if you guys think uh, referees suck in the NHL, well, uh, guess what, dude? It's not um, league specific. Uh, referees suck in the NHL and referees suck in the NFL. In fact, that Rams-New uh, Orleans game, that blown call single-handedly cost the New Orleans Saints a shot at the Super Bowl. Just my opinion. I'm sure people can talk about all the missed calls earlier in the game, but those were early in the game. This was right at the end. This was a deciding call that would have changed the game. I don't know. They wanted to let them play, but they're getting blasted today in the media because they missed that call. So, All right, sorry to go off on a little NFL rant, but getting back to the Chicago Wolves. After the football game, I watched the Chicago Wolves get their butts kicked by the Milwaukee Admirals 4 to nothing. Now, uh, Fucali was in net for the Chicago Wolves because Legacy is up with us. But uh, honestly, it was cool to watch. It was cool to see a lot of the players that we were talking about. I mean, Reed Duke was out there. Quinney was out there. Hika, Brandstrom, Haig, uh, Colzar, Daniel Carr. I mean, all those guys were out there, and, and they played okay. They just got a couple bad breaks, and they lost this game. No big deal. It just sucks that I only get to watch a couple of Chicago Wolves games because there's no way in hell I'm going to actually pay money for the AHL to be able to watch AHL games. That's crazy. So, I don't know. Quickly, let's go over the stats for our friends, the Chicago Wolves. So, they've played 42 games. Their record is 23-14-4. Not bad, right? They're second place in the Central Division. 
That's not bad. Let's look at their stats real quick. So now remember, Brandon Perry, Brandon Perry played 29 games for the Chicago Wolves this year. So Daniel Carr just recently passed Brandon Perry for the points lead. Daniel Carr's played uh, 36 games. He's got 20 goals, 30 assists for 50 points. Brandon Perry played 29 games, had 18 goals, 24 assists for 42 points. Uh, Brooks Masick, a right winger, played 42 games, got 18 goals, 22 assists for 40 points. Cage Queenie, 39 games, 11 goals, 13 assists. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's, that's a good enough update, right, for the Chicago Bulls? Yeah, that's enough. All right, that's enough of the boring numbers, folks. Now, this is the portion of the podcast where I would roll into Hey Nights Nation. Now, I had a little bit of a struggle last week in uh, copying over some uh, audio from some videos, so I am going to go to the Fortress today. And I'm going to record some audio, and I will have that segment up and running for episode 28 of the VGK Bug Eye Guy podcast. No Hey Nights Nation this week. I apologize, but next week I'll have something out there from you, the fans. So since we don't have that, what should we talk about? Well, I want to come up with one other segment. I haven't quite picked out a name yet, but it's going to be like random topics or random stuff. I, I don't know what it is, but... But this is going to be my new segment eventually once I figure out what I'm going to call it, where I just talk about random stuff. This week, I've got three topics I want to talk about. The first one, a fellow Vegas Golden Knights fan. Now, I didn't put this in last week's podcast because, honestly, I forgot. After the Frost of Fortress game, now, this was where the Vegas Golden Knights told all the fans, hey, wear white jerseys. Our team's going to wear white jerseys at the Fortress, which are normally our away jerseys, but we're going to wear home jerseys. We're going to wear, you, you know what I'm getting at. You know where I'm going, right? Problem is the Vegas Golden Knights are 0-3 when we wear the stupid white jerseys in the arena. It's like bad juju. So this particular fan, I've met him a couple of times. I've interacted on social media. He was like, I'm going to burn these white jerseys. So he went in his backyard and he put one of his white jerseys into a fire pit and was like, we got to get rid of the bad juju. We got to burn the white jersey. People went nuts. People went ape shit. Oh my God, I can't believe you're burning a jersey. Um, I would take it off your hands and all these people like, I wish I had a jersey. Okay. I get that argument. I I get it. And burning a jersey, I, I... I I personally probably wouldn't do it, but I kind of saw where he was coming from. And I was like, okay, he's just trying to get rid of the bad karma. Uh, This particular individual is probably in a good financial situation to where he can afford to burn a jersey. Now, some of you folks that can't, I apologize, but that's not this guy's fault. It's not his fault that you can't afford a jersey or that you want his jersey that he wants to burn. I mean, that's, that's, I, I, I don't know what else to say other than, It was his choice. It was his piece of property. He chose to do it. He quickly pulled the video down. Uh, Good on him because he was getting a lot of negative pushback and negative feedback, and I understand that. But at the same time, I I kind of understand why he did it. Now, I I wouldn't have gone that route, but I see why he did. We had to get rid of the bad juju, the bad karma. I, I, I completely get it. But maybe the way he went wasn't exactly ideal. I don't know. That's up to everybody to get their own uh, interpretation and their own, you know, judgment on him burning the jersey. To me, I thought it was kind of shitty, but I knew why he did it, and I don't have an issue with it. If you guys have an issue with it, hey, it is what it is. All right, another topic, baby reveals. So this is a thing that uh, the bug eye guy and the bug eye wife, we're not really uh, familiar with this, see, our kids are older. Our kids are teenagers now. So 13 years ago, or I guess it would be almost 14 years ago, 13 and a half years ago, uh, when we found out we were having kids, and I say kids, plural, because we have twins, um, we didn't, they wasn't know this fill a balloon full of pink or blue and then pop it and you find out what your baby reveal is. And right off the bat, you guys are thinking, bug eye guy, how'd you go from talking hockey to talking about baby reveals? Well, Jonathan Marchesol and Ryan Carpenter of the Vegas Golden Knights this week announced on social media the gender reveal of their future babies. Marchie in his looks like his living room had a balloon full of colors and his kids helped him pop the balloon and the colors came out and it was like, oh, cool, he's having a boy. And then uh, Ryan Carpenter's was cooler. He was up on what looked like his balcony at his house and he had his little son with him with a little stick 
And when they hit a puck, the puck exploded and it changed colors and it was blue. So congratulations to both those guys for having gender reveals on social media. And that's cool that they're having kids. Now, here's the issue with the bug eye guy. Back in the day, we didn't have that. I mean, back in the day, we were just getting cell phones that had cameras built into them. So, I mean, you, I mean, it's just, here's what happened to the bug eye guy. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a personal story here real quick. I'm not going to go too long. I'm not going to go too far off topic, but... Since Marchie and Carpenter want to talk about babies, I'll talk about babies because my podcast, right? So the bug eye wife and the bug eye guy were dating and we were both in the military. We were overseas. Now, uh, the bug eye wife uh, at the time, the bug eye guy's girlfriend, you know, she knew she was pregnant. So we went to the, to the base doctor and you go in, you know, to get a checkup or whatever. And the base doctor people were a little weird, and they're like, you got to go see a specialist out in town. Now we're thinking, look, people, we're in Japan. Out in town is a bunch of people that don't speak English. But either way, they made an appointment. They sent us out to a specialist, and we go to this office, and a uh, lady comes in with the little ultrasound, and she kind of moves the thing around, and then she walks out, and then someone else comes in takes a look. Now, the communication skills here are not exactly uh, up to par. Uh, the bug eye wife doesn't speak the Japanese. I don't, uh, straight O, left O, right O, that's what you tell the cabos. You just add an O at the end, and I know that's super derogatory, but that's what you do. You go straight O, left O. I mean, that's, I don't speak their language. They don't speak my language. I don't speak their language. But now we got doctors involved. So finally, this doctor comes in, and he's, the first couple were nurses, and they were looking at it like techs or maybe ultrasound techs or something, but. Finally, the doctor comes in and he's, uh, he's looking at it and, you know, the girlfriend at the time, future bug eye wife, seems a little nervous. And the doctor says, to hot beat. I say, what? He says, to hot beat. Like, uh, yeah, to heartbeat, yeah, the bug eye girlfriend and the baby, to heartbeat, yeah? No, 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 to hot beat. Um... That's where the bug eye guy was like, uh, twins? Yeah. Holy shit. And then the bug eye guy had twin girls, identical twin girls. Yeah, I'm in trouble. I get it. They're teenagers. I get it. In fact, people used to always tell me. Now, I don't know if this is karma or whatever. This little Filipino dude that I was in the military with, he always tell me, hey, whenever you uh, have a kid, if you have a girl first as a boy, it's payback for all the bad things you did growing up as a kid. If you're a jerk to girls, or if you're a jerk to your girlfriend, this is payback. And I'm thinking, fuck, I got two. Was I really that bad? Come on, I wasn't that bad, was I? Nah. Honestly, it was a miracle. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me and the bug eye wife, and we love our daughters. I wish my one daughter would watch hockey. She comes to the games and she's on her phone the whole time because she wants nothing to do with it, but I'm not leaving her home alone. My other daughter loves it. She loves watching YouTube videos of old fights and old big hits. I mean, she loves it. So, you know what? Hey, so Marchie and Carpenter doing their little name reveal. That's cool. That's awesome. But I wish there was video of me at that uh, doctor's office in southern Kyushu, Japan, uh, I wish there was video of my reaction. I mean, I was, uh, uh that's all I'm saying. I, I wish there was video of my reaction because I'm not going to lie. Kind of caught me off guard a little bit. Probably caught you guys off guard too. When you found out you were having a baby. Now imagine having two at the same time as an E5 in the military, not making shit for money. And <laughs> I mean, Hey, made through it, survived and, uh, wouldn't have it any other way. But those name reveal things, those are cool. I like watching those on social media. I think people come up with creative ideas. I don't know. All right, this next topic was something I was going to talk about in the what the puck segment, the, the rant portion of the podcast. But I got something else for the rant. It's not going to be that long this time. And I, I th this needs to be addressed. So folks that go to the Fortress to watch games, the parking situation down there at T-Mobile, you've got... MGM, which is kind of a long walk. You've got Excalibur. You've got Park MGM, which is the old Monte Carlo, and you got New York, New York. Now, the Bug Eye guy, when I bought a season tickets, I also bought parking passes for New York, New York. That's where we go. That's where we park. We've been doing it since the very first game of the inaugural season. 
something happened about three weeks ago where New York, New York people that run the parking garage came up with this awesome plan on how they were going to funnel cars out. Now, I don't know who came up with that plan. I don't know what their, their thought process was, but they need to change it because it was working fine before and everyone was zippering out fine. And now they've got it where I could be on the seventh deck and I prefer to park on the roof and you could sit up there and not move for 20, 30 minutes while they funnel cars out below. Used to be one and one. Zippering is a normal concept. One car comes out, one car comes in. It's not that difficult. But the, uh, the folks that run the parking garage at New York, New York, um, you guys have pretty much effed up the whole thing. And I know a lot of other fans are a little butthurt and pissed off because uh, it was working fine for a year and a half. Why change it now? I don't know. All right, one more topic before I get into the rant. And this is a reference season ticket holder selling tickets now. It's funny. This whole season, there hasn't really been a lot of chatter on social media about, oh, fans are selling their tickets, and uh, I can't afford to go because they're selling their tickets for so much money. That has not been the case this year. Uh, I blame partially on the whole not being able to use StubHub thing. But the Bug Eye guy, uh, there's been a couple games where I've sold my tickets just over face value. I mean, I trust me, I've been to a lot of games this year, but... The games that we've tried to unload tickets, it's been kind of a challenge this year, which I'm hoping they don't up our tickets next year because, okay, last year was the inaugural season and there was kind of a markup. There's kind of a premium on tickets. But this year, you go to a game during the week, you can get a decent price. Now, I know you got to pay the fees. I know the fees suck. But still, if you're getting a ticket for, you know, $75 plus fees, that's not really bad compared to last year. I don't know. I know a lot of people are pissed off about the Pittsburgh game, and I get it. But if you looked on StubHub, an hour and a half before, I'm not, I apologize, not StubHub, Flash Seats. An hour and a half before puck drop, the cheapest ticket was $120 plus fees for the Pittsburgh game. I know that's a lot, especially for the upper bowl is a lot of people like, ooh, the poor upper bowl. Screw you. I love the upper bowl. I love section 217. I got a great view. I can see all the ice, <laughs> whatever. But yeah. It was the most expensive game on flash sheets for the Vegas Golden Knights to date for this year. I mean, it's the one that's been the most money. Well, duh, because it's Pittsburgh. It's Sidney Crosby. What did you expect? Of course, those tickets are going to be high. And of course, there's a lot of Pittsburgh fans. The Vegas Golden Knights fans had the opportunity to sell these tickets and make a little bit of money. And you guys are thinking, oh, you should not be able to make money. And that's bad. You're a bad fan. No, had this argument for over a year and a half. Uh, my season tickets are my tickets. I can choose to sell them for whatever I want. If you don't like it, tough shit, buy your own season tickets. That's really how I feel. But people that sell these tickets, it's not like they're selling them just for money. And that's what a lot of non-season ticket holders don't really understand. Uh, you guys probably don't understand that for people that are on the payment plan, January 20th, yesterday, was the first payment for next season's tickets. So if you sell the Pittsburgh tickets, the one game, and make a good amount of money, you use that money to pay for your season tickets for next year. That's the way it works. If you really think that someone's going to go to 44-plus games every single game, come on, man. We work. We got families. We got personal lives. We got other stuff. It's very hard to go to every single game. That's why they let you sell your tickets. I don't know. The fact that people are a little butthurt about this, I, I really don't care. I'm glad there wasn't that much chatter, but there was enough to get me a little irked to talk about it on the podcast. But honestly, I still wish they would let us use StubHub, but I'm not really selling many tickets right now anyway, so I guess it doesn't matter. All right, folks, time to come to the end of the podcast, and uh, you know how I end all my podcasts, right? How about a little bit of... What the puck? Seriously, what the puck? All right, this week's What the Puck topic is a guy by the name of Big Gucci Berry. You guys familiar with this guy? He is a uh, Instagram star, I guess you can say. He's on a lot of social media. Um, he does a lot of uh, interesting things, I guess you can say. The reason I'm talking about him on this week's episode of the podcast is uh, he decided, and he's this big fat dude, he decided that he was going to lay in front of a hockey net and take a slap shot to the nuts. Yeah, 
he took a slap shot to the nuts. This guy, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I watched the video like 20 times because I thought it was hysterical. And uh, if that ever happened to me, I'd be in the same situation, bent over, you know, wanting to throw up and crying. It hurts so bad. But it got me thinking. What happens in your life when you're born and you're raised by your parents and then you grow up and you eventually become an adult? At what point in your life do you go, man, I think it would be a great idea to sit in front of a hockey goal and take a slap shot to the ball sack. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? And then I could film it and I could be Instagram famous. Well, yeah, he did get a lot of notoriety. I mean, all the major podcasts, all the major social media sites went off on this video. I mean, it was it, it went viral. But, dude, you took a hockey puck to the junk. That, to me, is something that would never cross my mind. That would never... I don't know. I mean, if I was wanting to be famous, that's really low on my list of things to do to be famous, to be honest with you. I mean, do you guys know who Catfish Cooley is? Catfish Cooley is another, uh, I guess he's technically a comedian now, um, but he got his start doing the same thing, doing weird videos, doing uh, weird, uh, like eating really, really hot things or eating really, really disgusting things, or like waxing, like waxing parts of his body where, you know, big grown men don't usually wax, but uh, to make a funny video. He's funny. He also kind of uh, goes off on rants too, which I, I enjoy most of his stuff. I think he's very talented and funny. But again, I would never eat a ghost habanero XXX triple fire chip, or I think he did a sucker one time. Yeah, I'm not interested in that. I would never, never, ever eat something that has a uh, warning on the label that this could, like, burn your insides. I mean, that's really what it is. I mean, some of this stuff, this hot sauce he's tried, and, I mean, it, it would never cross my mind. But there are some people out there. I mean, and honestly, I think the whole jackass era, the jackass of the late 90s and early 2000s, kind of brought to mainstream media. Hey, you do funny shit that makes people laugh and you can get famous. The problem is, yeah, you get famous, but you took a bowling ball or a hockey puck to the nutsack or you ate something that burned your insides. I mean, at what point is it like, okay, that's cool. I'm famous, but fuck, I might be in the emergency room. But again, when you're at home and you're sitting on the toilet, and you're scrolling through your phone and watching all these funny videos that Facebook or Twitter loves to show you. You can't help but watch, right? You can't, like, look away. You're the guy taking the shot to the nuts. It's not like you're not going to watch it. It's kind of like really bad injuries when, when professional players get hurt. And the Dallas Cowboys had an example a couple weeks ago where Alan Hearns pretty much snapped his ankle in half. And it was disgusting and it was gruesome. But you have to watch. It's like you can't look away at least one time. you got to see it. Same thing with these guys. These guys, they, they put out very funny stuff. Don't get me wrong. It's very entertaining. I just don't understand their thought process to doing it, other than they just want to be famous. And maybe they make money. Maybe they make good money. I, I don't know. I don't make shit doing all my podcasts and social media stuff. I just do it for fun. Maybe they're making good money. All I know is the bug eye guy is not interested, and I will not do something like that. I'm not eating no nasty-ass shit. I'm not eating something that's going to burn my mouth. I'm not going to do something that's going to hurt. Uh, I'm too old for that. But good on you, Catfish Cooley, and good on you, Big Gucci Berry, for doing dumb shit and making me laugh. As a reminder, everybody listening to this podcast, the VGK Bug Eye Guy does not condone people taking slap shots to the nuts or eating ridiculously hot stuff that can burn their insides. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm just talking about it. I think it's a stupid idea. I think it's a bad idea. Hopefully, you guys think that it's good entertainment, but kind of dumb. All right. As a quick reminder, if you guys want something to be discussed on the What the Puck portion of the podcast, reach out to me on social media. I'm available on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, at VGK Bug Eye Guy. I'm also available at www.vgkbugeyeguy.com. My website's kind of cool. Um, you go there, you can listen to all my podcasts, and then over on the right, I've got to reach out to the Bug Eye Guy, come back around about the Bug Eye Guy. Um, yeah, there's a couple areas over there that uh, you can link to my social media, and you can reach out to me, and you can say, hey, Bug Eye Guy, you should talk about this in the rant, or hey, Bug Eye Guy, why don't you talk about that? 
Now remember, Vegas Golden Knights fans, the Bug Eye Guy does this podcast for you. This podcast is designed by me, a fan for you, fans of the Vegas Golden Knights. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy the format. If you have any issues or you want anything changed, again, reach out to me on social media. I am all about uh, making this podcast uh, better for you, the listener. But at the same time, if you don't like it just because you don't like my voice or you don't like that I did something, um, tough shit. This is my podcast. All right, folks, thanks so much for tuning in to episode 27 of the VGK Bug Eye Guy podcast. I really do appreciate it. Normally, this is the portion of the podcast where I tell you to tell a friend to like my podcast, but I'm not going to do that this week. I need a favor from you guys. If you listen to the VGK Bug Eye Guy podcast on my website, on Podbean, or on Apple Podcast, I need you, if you like this podcast, and I'm not forcing you to do anything, but if you enjoy this podcast, please go on to whatever podcast platform you use to listen to this and write a review. Let me know I'm doing good. Do something. I need to get my reviews up just a little bit so I score better in the ranking process so that more people can listen to my podcast. Now, even if you think my podcast sucks and you think I'm garbage, do me a favor. Go on and write a review and say, hey, bug eye guy, I'm writing a review. Your podcast sucks. You're garbage. I just need the review. That's it. That's all I'm asking for. I don't ask for much from you Vegas Golden Knights fans. I'm asking for a little help reviewing my podcast, and be honest with me. Now, if you're going to totally blast me, I'd prefer you reach out to me either via email, vgkbugeyeguy at gmail.com, or reach out to me on social media. But if you want to do it on Apple Podcasts and leave a review and go, I suck, hey, that's fine. At least I know you care enough to leave a review for the Bug Eye Guy. All right, episode 27 is in the books. Again, next week, we're going to talk about recaps from Minnesota and Nashville, And then there probably won't be a podcast the following week because our Vegas Golden Knights all-star break, uh, bye week, not much hockey is going to be going on. All right, Vegas Golden Knights fans, I'm done. Finished. Episode 27 is over. I'll talk to you guys next week. I love you. And as always, go Knights go. You have been listening to the VGK Bug Eye Guy Podcast. The VGK Bug Eye Guy is available on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook at VGK Bug Eye Guy. For a full recap of this podcast or to listen to past episodes, please visit www.vgkbugeyeguy.com.